coming for it. This YouTube presentation, uh, which we decided to do, uh, Lee Clemens is going to be presenting, but uh, we've got some a little bit of stuff to go over first with you guys, all right? First off, um, I want to thank the Historical Commission that's here. I want to thank uh, Tim Levante and Alex, the Millville Cable, for uh, doing this uh, videotaping, and uh, that way we can have this for historical purposes, okay? Yes. Now, before the presentation, which is going to be on the Chestnut Hill Meeting House, and uh, Lee Clements, uh, who's the uh, finance of our finance person of our committee, uh, I want to go over some uh, uh, some things that were going on within the committee, things that we've done, and things that we're going to be doing. That way, you folks in YouTube land will get a chance to know what this commission is all about and uh, what we're going to present in the future. Uh, we focus on YouTube. Tim and I had a conversation a while back. Um, we were going to do originally put the presentations on the uh, Millville webpage, but I had a discussion with Tim and we feel that it's a lot better to present them on YouTube. And uh, that way, a lot of people are on YouTube and everything else, you know, kind of deal. So, anyway, that's what we're going to focus on. So, what have we accomplished in the last uh, year and a half, even through uh, pandemic? and all of that. Uh, a while ago, I did a presentation on the growth and prosperity of Millville. Now, I mention these because you can search for these on YouTube, and even though it's been a couple of years since we've done that, actually it's more than that now, um, you're gonna get a chance you can review. So that's the first one. And a few months ago, uh, Bob Bowen was an invited guest, and he did the transportation of Millville, transportation of occurred in the, in the years of Nova, right? And today, Lee's going to do the uh, presentation on the meeting house. So that's what we've got in place today. Now, what are we going to work on in the future? Well, we're very fortunate that uh, we've got, a, we've got uh, a total of uh, five members now, and maybe another one uh, in April or May. Um, one of the things that we're working on today, one is the quiz. Maybe you've heard of it, maybe you haven't. I've been fortunate enough to put a whole bunch of questions together about the town. And I've been testing it on different people and it's created some interest because a lot of people have only been here say 10, 15, even 20 years and they don't know about the history of Milbo. So we're working on that and we want to present these things to you in the future so that this will be a, um, a way of keeping the history of the town and it's going to be obviously documented in the cloud, so to speak. Okay. Uh, a while ago, I was fortunate enough to work with uh, Chronicle, and uh, uh, they did a presentation of the mills of Millville on three towns. I was fortunate to be part of one of them. 
and I say I, but uh, it was the town is what I was concerned with in uh, presenting information. And in there, I had some questions to create the interest. Well, um, what we're going to do is I've created over 125 questions for the town about the town and its function, buildings, people, whatever, anything to do with the town. And uh, I got together with Tim, and what we're going to do, starting April 1st, we're going to put out 10 questions. And we're going to put 10 questions out each month. At the beginning of the month, the questions will come out. At the end of the month, I'll present the answers, okay? And you'll get a chance to know more about the town as time goes on. I just want to, you know, create some interest, all right? Other areas that we want to work on in the future, um, I've got some web links about Millville's documentation. There's a lot of information online uh, that you can research if you want to, but you'll have the information. So we're going to do, that's going to be a short blurb uh, of all the links on the web. Another area we're going to work on is the trains, about the trains that uh, come through town today, some in the past, some never happened. So we're going to work on this. This is going to take some time but we're working on it now. Another one's gonna be on the Blackstone Canal. That uh, River Bend Farm, which is in Whitensville, I believe. Uh, there's uh, some great models on the canal system, uh, the locks and all of that. We're gonna be working on that. That'll probably be filmed over there because of all the models they have. You know, the, the, it's some great information. Another one, uh, this was a, uh, something Margaret Carroll was going to work on. It's called Etched in Stone. It deals with the uh, five different cemeteries in Millville. And uh, we'll be working on that in the future. And the last one, uh, well, there's going to be more, but as of right now, uh, at our last meeting last month, um, I was able to get together with the Blackstone Historical Commission. And I got a list of uh, the veterans of the Civil War. Now, Millville became independent in 1916. So prior to that, we were part of Blackstone. So what we do, what we're gonna do is we're gonna take the list of uh, Civil War veterans from Blackstone, and we're gonna find out the names of the people who lived in Millville. And we're gonna create a list of Civil War veterans and present it to you, okay? In the meantime, I have an assignment for you. And the assignment is going to be this. I'd like you to go on the web, on YouTube, and search for a title, something called Along the Blackstone by the National Park Service. In there, it's going to be along the Blackstone River. So hence, it's going to be by the National Park Service, and they've got a ton, a ton of videos. So if you want to learn about some history of the Blackstone River, you've got your little piece of information, all right? So what I'd like to do now is I want to introduce you to uh, our financial officer on the Historical Commission of Mobile is uh, Lee Clement, and he's going to do this presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Emil. Uh, as Emil was saying, tonight's presentation will be on the Chestnut Hill Meeting House um, that was built, as you can see there, in 1769. A uh, little background on myself. Again, my name is Lee Clement. I've had a lot of interest in this meeting house since I was very young. I've lived in Millville since I was six years old. And I can remember with garden shears trimming all 301 gravestones for Carl Frost Jr., who was the caretaker of the property at the time. And he gave me a penny a stone for trimming all the, all the grass around the stones. That's when I really first started getting interested. At 21 years old, I spent two weeks in the cemetery um, on my hands and knees, laying down, whatever it took, and I have a book with all 301 stones at the time, all written down, all the names, epitaphs, dates, and I also put a map together, so if anything ever happened, the stones could return to their original site. Uh, that's some of the interest I've had in this building, and currently today, I am the president of the Chestnut Hill Meeting House Association. And I'd like to get started <clears throat> on how it all started. It actually all started when people started coming into Menden, because we were Menden back then, along with a dozen other towns. We were all Menden. 
and it was 1663 when people started moving into the Menden area. Uh, Menden became a town in 1667. Okay, and how it all started is Menden by 1769 had already built four meeting houses. Um, and then when they wanted the people in the southern sector, which was us in the Millville, Blackstone area, the southern sector, the meeting house that they had was getting all run down and they wanted people to put money into it so they could bring it back to life. Well, the people in the southern sector lived pretty far away from the center of Menden because that's where the meeting house was, right in Founders Park in the center of Menden. And they didn't really want to donate the money from the southern sector to fix the meeting house in the northern sector because they had to travel seven to 10 miles to get there. So they wanted their own meeting house. So in 1766, they divided Menden into the North Parish and the South Parish in 1766. And that's when it really all started to begin building this meeting house up here in Chester Hill. Okay, again, church members living in the South didn't really want to donate. And let it be known that people didn't really move to this area, Millville area, the Southern Parish, until about the 1700s. And little does anybody know that Chestnut Hill Road is one of the first roads ever put in Menden. Uh, they wanted a, a cart path put in to get them to the south pastures to get the cattle and to hay it, get feed for the cattle. And that's how the South Parish started and people slowly started moving in in the 1700s. So when they had this meeting in 1776, majority of the vote okay, was to build something in the South Parish. And at the time, there was only 500 families in Menden at the time this took place. Okay, as you can see there, the Chestnut Hill Meeting House from an angle, uh, Thayer Street being to the side toward me, and the front of the Meeting House faces the cemetery grounds. The leading actors and promoters were the first deacons, the ones who really got the ball rolling to build a Meeting House, uh, was Joseph Benson, John Warfield, and Joseph Day. And also John Warfield at the time, lived right across the street from the meeting house. And the biggest promoter of building the meeting house in this area was because Bononi Benson, who lived behind the meeting house at the time, donated all the land. So that helped in the decision quite a bit as to the area where the meeting house was gonna be built. So when they started building the meeting house, a lot of people chipped in uh, to help get everything going, all uh, the nails necessary, the uh, lumber that was necessary, and Ensign Pelletier Darling, he was the first one to cut down the oak tree to start building the timbers and all the wood uh, for the meeting house. And at the time, the Darling family lived right at the top of Chestnut Hill Road, across from Kempton. The nails were provided by Jaffet Taft, the blacksmith. Okay, he's the one who pr provided most of the nails for the meeting house, and that would have been the Taft blacksmith shop at the corner of Fisher and Old Chestnut, because that has been around, it's gone now. Actually, Henry Ford took it apart and moved it. Uh, but it had been around since 1726 the Taft blacksmith shop. So most of all the nails for the meeting house were made there. The huge stepping stones, I couldn't find anything that said exactly where they came from, but uh, a Jesse Wheelock was paid so much money to rent his four oxen to move stone for the meeting house. Uh, but I could not determine exactly where the stones came from.
The raising was a time of great acceleration, stimulated, no doubt, by more than one kind of spirit. Tradition says that some of the merry people handed out out of their pockets coppers to make the pins fit tighter into the beams. Um, I mean, we'll never know that for sure until the day ever came it was disassembled, which I hope never happens, but it did come close. It came very close to uh, demolishing that meeting house at one time. Two skillful joiners from Dedham had to be called in to, uh, to build a pulpit in the soundboard, which is up above it. Uh, they came from that area to build that. In the body seats, what you see here in this uh, picture, they were originally putting the meet in the meeting house in 1769 when they built it, but later, at a later date, they took them all out, and it actually had pews like in a church in the first floor down the bottom, and they moved all the cubicles upstairs into storage. And I believe in 1807, they took the pews out and put those back. And according to um, what I was reading is, the more money you donated, the closer you sat to the pulpit. That was your cubicle. The more money you donated. Um, it was considered for the first time that the date inscribed on the peak uh, was the ninth month of 1769, that it was complete, but it was not fully complete until 1807. Uh, there was a lot of work that needed to be done on that meeting house. It didn't have windows in 1769. Uh, they were harassed by wasps and squirrels uh, during, during mass. Yeah, and that went on for quite a bit of time until they could raise money to get the meeting house completed. There was no found service or dedication. Uh, it was just a meeting house at the time. It wasn't Protestant, Catholic, Presbyterian. It, it was not a designated religion at the time. It was a meeting house. And that, by the way, is still the Bible that's in there to this date. It's still up there on the pulpit. Okay, like I was saying, repairs until 1807. In the meantime, old people have told us it became a filial resort, like I was saying, of squirrels and black wasps. And the freaks of those squirrels and wasps during the Sabbath services often severely tempered the gravity of their juvenile years. People were getting stung, squirrels were running right on, on the soundboard and across the pulpit while they were giving services. During 1807, uh, quite a few repairs were made to the outside of the house and important ones within. The old body seats gave place to pews, like I was telling you, they took them out, stored them upstairs, put the pews in. And later on, around 1807, I believe, they put them back. The plain carpentry was done by a, a gentleman called uh, David Wilson. Uh, $341 for pew fixing, plastering, painting, etc. And by everything, was, all was said and done, it came to a total of $500. And back then, that was quite a bit of money, back then, for people to come up with. Taxes and uh, contributions were then cheerfully paid for those days who were the most prosperous and happy. Okay, even enjoyed by the precinct. They were very happy to have their own meeting house in the South Parish, that's why. For 43 years, okay, they had no competitor. The Chester Hill Meeting House was the only meeting house in the entire area until 1812 when the uh, Friends Meeting House was built in Uxbridge. It's at the corner of Route 98 and 146A. And all the material I'm telling you tonight, I spent numerous hours in the old uh, library in Menden in the basement 
researching all this information. That's where all this information came from that I'm telling you tonight. And I also have it in a book I did. All this information is documented. Okay, the changes gradually left the old house in some measure of desolate until the question came to be voted whether it be better to demolish or preserve it. Okay, thank God they decided to preserve it because it wouldn't be here today. Okay, they gathered up to $1,000 uh, to redo the meeting house. And I never knew until I read this research, um, they replaced all the windows, the front doors, the side doors. Um, I think they put a chimney in, in a stove at this time. Until then, people used to use these old foot warmers to keep themselves warm during the winter services. And thank God there was never a fire because I can't think of anything more dangerous. They used to put hot coals in there and put them down by their feet in, in the pews. These are um, since the Grand Centennial at which Reverend Alan Ballou, okay, the blessed memory and operator this day in Adden Theater of Worcester, um, that was for the 100th anniversary of the meeting house at which time that they did put a lot of money into the meeting house and replaced a lot of the cladboard, uh, windows, doors. By the burning of the old Benson House that stood right behind the meeting house, um, until then, they had a lot of records of the meeting house of things that took places. But when this house burned down, all the records went with it, so they lost a lot of the original names and work that was done on the meeting house. They could only save a little bit. That, by the way, is not the, the house. <laughs> I, I put that in. I just don't want anybody to think that was the house I burned. Reverend Benjamin Ball was the first regular pastor and preacher, settled September 14, 1768. His memorials are not very savory, if we may credit the statements contained in an old anonymous pamphlet printed in 1773, which entitled A Short Account of State of Menden, the parish relative to Mr. Ball's settling there in work of ministry, September 14, 1768, there is quite a bit documented about him. Um, they didn't fare well to this gentleman. When he first became pastor, he settled for people giving him all his cordwood for the winter. Then he raised it a little more. Now he wanted to pay yearly. Then he wanted clothes for him and his family. Then he wanted food. So it kept going up and up and up, all his wants and needs. And mysteriously one night, he took his family and moved on, never to be seen again. Okay, second pastor was Preserve Smith. He was his successor. He was installed October 2nd, 1805. And his salary was 333.33. I don't know where they came up with that number. <laughs> he had a generous nature, a generous soul, and an expanding mind. And a practical aptitude for his duties. So everybody really liked him compared to the other reverend they had. And this is the other reverends that served 1820 to 1822. Otis Converse, no, I don't think he has a sneaker company now. I... <laughs> and in 1826, for a few years, Reverend Nathaniel Baca, Orthodox Congregationalist, was named minister. And that is a picture of the meeting house today. In this house, the last meeting house of Menden, after long preliminary allegations, this 
severe conflict of opinion in regard to the division of the town decided the contest by ballot, aimed stirring excitement. January 30th, 1895, in the Menden South Parish became town of Blackstone. When Blackstone took over, they didn't have a town hall. They didn't have a meeting house. Uh, this was their meeting house when Blackstone took over Menden, when they be broke off and became Blackstone. This was their meeting house until they decided to build Harrison Hall, uh, which was located right where their, new, their town hall is now. That's where Harrison Hall was located. They called it back then by the Grand River, the Blackstone River. Okay, and then Millville broke off from Blackstone in 1916. Um, anybody have any questions on the meeting house whatsoever? I do. I was interested in those foot warmers. Uh, is there any preserved? Um, you are not in the meeting house. There's none preserved. Uh, but I'm a big collector of antiques, and I've been trying to get one for a while. Uh, they go for. You can still get them. They're still around. They're about eighty dollars today. Yeah, they're still around. They're they're tin. The four sides are tin. And, and they used to put hot coals in them and just put them by their feet. First I've heard of them. I'm intrigued. Yeah, yeah there, there's something. There's something. And in fact, the last one I saw, there's one located at uh, Burnett Mill. There's one for sale there. Oh, really? In Burnett Mill, right on the first floor when you walk in. Yeah, it's about $80. And I can't talk them down. <laughs> when they built the building, was the cemetery there at the same time? The cemetery was pro is there before, before. A, f a few stones. Because if you look at the cemetery, there's stones in there going back to 1702. You know, so that was there before. But only Benson's one of the oldest, oldest graves in there. Okay. Yeah, and then Daniel's family is there. Um, it, you, you'd recognize a lot of names, a lot, a lot of names out of there from looking at the history amended, a lot of Tafts. And Thea, Thea's a buried there, which Thea Street's named after. Yeah. So I want to thank you very much, and unless anybody has any questions. Um, the meeting house, we try to leave it open as much as possible when we can get somebody to stay there on a Saturday or a Sunday to open it up so we can have guests come in. Uh, if you're driving by, there'll be a flag on the pole saying open, and everybody's welcome to come take a look. Uh, and if you want to get a hold of me, I mean, I'm on Facebook, uh, Lee Clement. Uh, get a hold of me on Facebook, uh, Google me, and I could meet someone there with the key. I have the original key to get in. Uh, quite a f There's about four or five men members that have keys to the meeting house. So uh, if you know anybody that wants a tour, get a hold of me. I'd be glad to. Okay. Lee, do they um, have any... Do they have like church services there from time to time? Once a year in May, we have our meeting there and the day after there's a service. Every May, we, because of COVID, we haven't been able to do it for the last couple of years, uh, but hopefully we can come back with that and it's in May that we, we have a service once a year. Yeah, okay. yeah. Any other questions? Well, thank you very much. Uh, I hope you learned something tonight. Oh, um, yes. The uh, organ. There's two organs upstairs. Uh, they don't work, but they are original. Uh, they're pretty much dry rotted. Uh, all the bellows are, are pretty much rotted out of them. And as far as upstairs, we, we limit it now to about four people to go up there at a time because they did, the building's so old. I also remember there being a graffiti still. There is. Yeah, a lot, a lot of people throughout the years that attended there um, carved their initials in the wood. In, in the behind all the pews or on the floor. And it's pretty interesting to read some of the dates. It, it is pretty interesting. I mean, I went through that thing with a fine tooth comb, looked everywhere, like CSI with a flashlight and all the cracks and, you know, people drop coins in church, you know? So I was hoping to find something old that we could display. <laughs> Anything else? Is there a, there's no basement? No basement. There's just a crawl space underneath. Yeah, and at one time, all the beams were exposed on the top. 
in the 1930s is when they put the ceiling in. Oh. Yeah, at one time all the beams were exposed. Awesome. Well, it looks like there's a granite uh, footing. Is that, is that a granite footing that it sets on? It's, a, it's actually all just stones that it's sitting on are probably no bigger than a foot by a foot. It's, it's, all, it's like a stone wall all the way around that it's setting on. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. And where they got the big stones, stepping stones as you walk in the, the two entrances, I, I don't know where, but they're huge. They're huge. I, they made their marks in work. So did they, uh, when the cemetery was there, was a raw iron fence there? Great question. Great question. I'm glad you said that. Uh, the wrought iron fence, prob during the last year, a tree fell on it and it bent it all. So we had it fixed. Uh, guy did a fabulous job fixing it. Fabulous job. So I did research on the fence because that's the one thing I never knew is when that fence went in. And that was replaced in 1896. In 1896, that was replaced. It was a white picket fence. In 1896 is when the Chestnut Hill, um, Chestnut Hill Meeting House and Cemetery Association took over the meeting house. 1896. Yeah. And that's who raises all the money now to keep it up. Uh, I'd like to mention to the Daniels sisters, uh, left quite a bit of money to the meeting house so we could keep it up to date, keep it painted and roofed. Uh, 1993 is the last time we put a roof on it. Yes? I have one more. Um, I can't remember because I was switching and stuff. Um, was the Chestnut Hill Meeting House something, I can't remember, it was like moved? Was it moved or was it always in that spot? It was always right there. Okay. Yeah. So that's why I must have, maybe it was a rumor around the kid. Yeah. No, it was, it was always right there. I, I found nothing documented on moving it. And if they would have did that, it probably would have been when they did all, all the rehab in uh, 1896. It's, but no, I read nothing about that at all. Okay. Anything else? Thank you.